We welcome all of our visitors. We're glad that you're with us this morning and hope that you will stay after our worship for our Bible class and then after that to uh, get to know us a little bit better. We've been going through the seven churches that are found in Asia Minor in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. We've gone through uh, six of them and we're going to look at the final message to the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 through 22. We're finding some very important lessons that need to be applied to us here at the Roy City Church of Christ and also to all churches of Christ who are striving to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and to follow the Bible. So we, we are seeing some good lessons as we look at these messages that Christ gave to His churches. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, Paul says, the churches of Christ greet you. Notice as Jesus is speaking, he's speaking to seven independent congregations. He's not speaking to a convention. He's not speaking to a president. He is not speaking to a pope. He's not speaking to an archbishop. He's speaking to seven congregations that are independent of one another. That's the organization you find of the church in the New Testament. Each congregation is independent. We use the word autonomous, self-governing, and he is giving a message to each one of those congregations. And now in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14, he is speaking to the angel or the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans, the church that's found in Laodicea. As we began our lesson of these seven churches, we discussed how that Christ was giving these messages to churches that were along a mailing route of the first century. And this is the final city. Laodicea was located in the Lycus River Valley, about southwest of the area of Phrygia in the first century. It became the wealthiest city of that region and the most important commercial center of that region. It was primarily known for three things, banking, wool, and medicine. One of the medicines that they were well known for was eye salve. Eye salve. Uh, they had a very poor water supply in that area, inadequate water. Therefore, they uh, had aqueducts that were built to bring water in to the city. And as a result, when the water got to the city, it was lukewarm. It was not hot water from a spring, and it was not the cold, refreshing water that you get from the snow melt of the mountains. By the time it got to the city through the aqueducts, the water was lukewarm. All three of these industries uh, are mentioned and they play a part in the message that Christ speaks to the church at Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 through 22. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful, true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were either cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten or discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He's writing to the brethren at Laodicea. And in verse 14 of Revelation chapter 3, he gives himself a self-designation. Verse 14, he says, I am the, the Amen, the faithful and the true witness. The word Amen in the Bible is a word that means what has been stated is absolutely true. It's really not a word that means I agree with as we use it today. Although that is true, we should agree with what is true. It means in the original, this is what is saying, this, this saying or this statement is absolutely sure. It's absolutely true. Jesus is the amen because what he says, what message comes from his mouth is absolutely sure. Absolutely true. So we can trust it. We know that it is firm. It is steadfast. It's not going to change. He is the faithful and true witness. He is that faithful one to God, the true witness of God's will. You read about his life of a witness of God's will in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So he is the one who truly witnesses the Father to us. We see God the Father in Jesus Christ because he represents him. Also in verse 14 of Revelation chapter 3, he says he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, some have misunderstood this. The Jehovah's Witnesses who knock on your door say that this means that this is the very first thing that the Father created. That Christ is the very first creature that God created and then through Christ He created everything else. He is the beginning of the creation of God. That's not what that verse is saying. The beginning of the creation of God means He is the originator of the creation of God. Not that He Himself is created. It is the same concept that you find in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 where it says He is the firstborn over all creation. He has preeminence over all creation. He is the firstborn over all creation because He is the originator of creation. Not that He Himself is created. He is the beginning point. John chapter 1 Verse 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Christ, being the Word who existed with the Father from all eternity, is the one through whom everything else in the universe came into existence. He is the Creator, not that uh, He is the Creator of all creation, and He has not created Himself. So when this verse is misused, uh, it's misused by false teachers who try to claim that Jesus is created. He's the beginning or the originator of the creation of God, not that he has created himself. Verses 15 through 20 of Revelation chapter 3, he gives a condemnation and a warning. This is one of the churches that he talks to where he sees nothing really good in them. There's no commendation. He doesn't commend them for anything. He gives them a condemnation and a warning, uh, verses 15 through 20. They are neither cold or hot. Remember when I talked about Laodicea and how the water would get to Laodicea through the aqueducts? And it was, it was a water that was lukewarm. It was not cold nor hot but lukewarm. And it, it was something that you would want to spew out of your mouth, something that you would want to spit out immediately. It was something that was not appealing. Christ said, I wish that you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, he's saying, you are a congregation of my people that makes me sick. He would wish that they were cold or hot. We know the uses of cold water. We know the uses of hot water. But how many of us have lukewarm water? How many uses that we have of that in our cooking or in our refreshing drink? If we want coffee, we usually want it hot or cold because you can get either coffee hot or cold nowadays. But who wants lukewarm coffee? 
Who wants a lukewarm soda? I know some people who like soft drinks that are hot. I don't understand that myself, but I like it cold. Hot or cold. Now, the reason why he says hot or cold is this. He said, you're a congregation of my people. You're not zealous for me. You're not on fire for me. You're not hot. And you're not cold. He says, I wish you were hot or cold. He wishes they were zealous for him. And he wishes they were cold. Because a totally fallen away Christian usually realizes their situation. And there is a hope for that person to repent and come back. But when you have Christians that are lukewarm, that means they're just religious enough not to realize their sickening condition. They're still assembling together. They're still worshiping. They're still going through the outward motions. But they're not hot. They're not zealous. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Laodicea was a very rich region because of the industry. And this evidently was a very wealthy church. And he says uh, they had the, under, the thinking that they were rich and in need of nothing. Verse 17, they say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. That is the danger of riches. We become self-sufficient and we start thinking, I have need of nothing. And therefore we become complacent. We become lukewarm. He says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Even though you might be physically rich, this is your spiritual condition. Spiritually speaking, you are bankrupt. Therefore, the outward condition, the way it looks on the outside for a church, does not always equal what it is really like on the inside spiritually. How many people judge a congregation by their building. They look at their building and say, oh, they got a nice building. Might have spent millions of dollars on it and they got a bunch of members inside and, and they're, they're giving all kinds of money upon the first day of the week and they judge that as a gauge by which they think that God must be blessing them. They must be right with God. But on the inside, they could be wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked Spiritually speaking. You can't get any worse than that. And so uh, he's saying this is your problem. You are external, but internally you are not what you ought to be. The wealth that a congregation might have, the, the type of building it may have, does not always indicate their faithfulness on the inside. Therefore he counsels them, verses 15 through 20, I want you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that they may be rich. Spiritual gold, spiritual wealth is what he's talking about. White garments. Garments was an industry there in Laodicea. That their nakedness be not revealed. They can buy these garments from Christ, so to speak. And they can be clothed in white. Righteousness of God's will. Being right in the, in the sight of God whether they were poor or rich physically, it did not matter. And he says, I want you to buy from me a salve that you might anoint their eyes, that you might be able to see. Medicine was uh, produced there in the Laodicea. Eye salve was one of the medicines that was produced there in that city. He says, here's what you need to, to overcome your spiritual blindness. You buy from me this spiritual eye salve that you might be able to see. And he warns them, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That word chasten means discipline, and it might be that in, in some other translations. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Zealous is being on fire. Zealous is being hot. Zealous means you're excited and passionate about the will of God. He tells them they need to repent. And he says, look, I love you. That's why I'm telling you this. You mean Christ, when he told the, his people there in Laodicea, when he said to them, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, that he loved them? That those were words of love? Yes. Yes. Because that's what they needed to hear. They didn't need to hear, smile, God loves you. 
That is true. And it's true that God loves them. And Christ is saying, I do love you. But here's what you need to hear. You're miserable, spiritually speaking. You're bankrupt, spiritually speaking. That's the message they needed to hear. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I discipline. See how love, rebuke, and discipline go together? And we have to understand that that's part of preaching. That's part of teaching the Word of God. And that's rebuking. And church discipline is a part of that as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 speaks of discipline disciplining members of the church who refuse to repent. That's part of love. And if we really love our members, we will. Christ says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. And as anyone will hear him, he says, I will open the door and he will come in and dine with me. That's talking about spiritual communion, having fellowship with Christ. Now this verse here... This verse here talking about opening the door, verse 20, is a verse that's misused within the religious world. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And they say all you have to do to become a Christian is open the door of your heart and let Jesus in. Accept him and you'll be saved. The problem is, in the context, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who have already been saved. They've already been baptized into Christ. And they became worldly, and they became lukewarm, and they shut Christ out of their lives. This is a message to the wayward congregation. This is a message to the wayward Christian, Revelation 3 and verse 20. Not for someone becoming a Christian. Therefore, when a person shuts Christ out of their life, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Notice Jesus doesn't force entry. Notice Jesus does not kick the door down because we all have a choice whether we're going to let Him back in our life or not. I stand at the door and knock and through His Word, He pleads with us and through this message, He says, I won't back in with your life. I want that fellowship to be restored, but you've got to be zealous. You've got to repent and then that sweet communion can be restored. Verse 21 and 22. He says, To him who overcomes, the Lord will grant him uh, to sit with him on His throne, just as He overcame and sat down with His Father on His throne. Christ overcame. He overcame the devil. He overcame uh, temptation. He overcame the cross. And He was resurrected. He's now at the Father's right hand. And if we overcome, we can sit down with Him and be victorious. We can overcome. And that word in the original means a conqueror. Be one who conquers. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now let's kind of summarize what we've looked at in these seven churches of Asia. I've brought it down into five different points that I think summarizes everything God wants us to know as He wrote to these churches. And we can see the message for us today and for faithful churches of Christ throughout this land and throughout the world. Number one, Christ wants His churches to be faithful. We can be faithful. We don't have the ability always to be famous. We don't always have the ability to be wealthy. Uh, We do not always have the ability to be the inventor of some new gadget or some new thing. But the one thing that every single Christian can be, if they want to be, is faithful. We can be faithful to the Lord if we want to be. Remember, there were two congregations out of the seven that Christ gave no rebuke to. He commended them and told them to remain faithful. So that tells me that People in a wicked society, as that nation and that empire was of the first century, if they can be faithful, so can we. 
He wants His people to be faithful. Revelation 2 and verse 10, He says, Be faithful into death, and I will give you a crown of life. If we want that crown of life, if we want to be with God in heaven, we must be faithful even into death. Number two, Christ wants His churches to be doctrinally pure. Doctrinally pure. He told and He commended the churches for uh, upholding the doctrine of Christ and for doing that which is right, for putting to test those who claimed to be apostles and were found liars. He commended the churches that stood up to the Nicolaitans, the false religious group of that day, and how that they uh, hated the deeds and the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which he also hated. And so he wants his people to be doctrinally pure. We must understand the importance of doctrine. And doctrine simply means teaching. You read 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus as Paul writes to those gospel preachers and notice how many times the word doctrine is used. How that we are to remain steadfast with sound doctrine. With healthy doctrine. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 8 says this, But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is worthless doctrine. There is such thing as worthless doctrine. There is such thing as false doctrine. And we must be aware of that, and we must not allow those things to creep in among us. Number three, Christ wants His churches to be morally pure. Not only pure in doctrine, but pure in morals. That means we must live the way the Lord Jesus wants us to live. That means when we're at work, when we're at school, when we're on the internet. That means when we are in our recreation, the things that entertain us, we are to be pure. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, we are to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. Those churches that engaged in worldliness, He rebuked them. Those churches that were involved in fornication, He rebuked them, told them to repent. And therefore, Christ wants His churches to be morally pure. Number four, Christ wants His churches to endure persecution. Persecution is going to come our way. In some places of the world, it's physical. For the most part here, it is um, just by word of mouth, although if things get worse in this nation, it could become a more physical persecution. But he wants his churches to endure that persecution, be faithful even if it means your death. I'll give you the crown of life, Revelation 2 and verse 10. James chapter 1 and verse 2, James says, Brethren, Count it all joy when you endure affliction or persecution because your faith is being tested and it will make us a stronger people. We must endure persecution as God's people. And number five, Christ wants His churches to be workers. Every time He addressed one of those churches, He says, I know your works, like Revelation 3 and verse 15. I know your works. He knows our works here at Royce City. He knows us as a congregation. And He knows the works that we do individually as Christians. And therefore, He wants us to be workers in His kingdom. But we must be workers in the kingdom faithfully, with doctrinal purity, with pure lives Enduring persecution. I want to end this study by looking at Romans chapter 12. Churches of Christ need a transformation movement. You've heard of the restoration movement in which people from this nation and other nations went back to the Bible to be the church of the Bible, to restore New Testament Christianity. That is important. But churches of Christ today need a transformation movement. Let me tell you why. 
Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We must be transformed. And churches of Christ throughout this land and throughout the world need a transformation movement in which we take seriously the will of God. Has the true church been restored? Yes. Does it need to be worked upon as far as being what the first century Christians were, being what Christ was? Yes. And that transformation movement takes a study of God's Word with the serious intent of doing what it says. And therefore, we could be one of those churches that if Christ wrote to us today, He would commend us and say, keep on keeping on. Remain faithful into death and I'll give you a crown of life. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that needs to become a member of the church and you do that by obeying the gospel and being saved. Believe in Jesus Christ, confess Him as the Son of God, repent of your sins, and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and the Lord will add you to His church. Acts 2 and verse 47. Perhaps there's someone here that's a lukewarm Christian. You're not totally falling away. You're not totally cold. And you're not zealous for the Lord either. You're not on fire for the Lord. And you know it, and the Lord certainly knows it. Repent. Come back to the Lord. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.